All right, welcome to Bourbon Real Estate. I'm Tyler, and I'm here with a special guest, Carl Kappas from Coldwell Banker. And Carl is a bigger bourbon aficionado than I am. Uh, just talking to him on the phone and him going through the... Uh, I'm going through my list of bourbons that I have on my shelf, and you're like, oh, what year is that? And I was like, I don't know. And you were like, it's laser etched at the bottom. If you tell me these letters, mm -hmm. I can tell you exactly which letter it is. So excited because he's got a uh, very exclusive collection here. Um, so excited to try some of these out and talk a little real estate. What, do you, what should we start with? Uh, honestly, if it was my choice, I'd probably tell you start with the Russells or start with the Buffalo Trace. They're lower proof. They're a little bit you know, more of a starter bourbon okay. in, for me personally. Everybody's palate's different, yeah. of course. But um, yeah, that one was done by a local group. Uh, and they tatered it, as you'd like to call it, with the wax and the stickers. And uh, I mean, I, it's probably the, one of the better Buffalo Traces I've ever had. Oh, I'm excited to try. Thank you for bringing these. Oh, you're welcome, man. Like I said, this is what this is one of the things that Bourbon's taught me is kind of like a lot about real estate is that it is a very community-based thing. You can meet some of the most interesting people in the world. You can, you know learn a lot of different cool things and it brings a lot of people together and I got into this whole bourbon hobby I'll call it probably about three years ago and then when COVID hit it was really crazy because like we had had a uh, I'm in a group that does a lot of charity stuff and we had a bottle share as you'd call it and we had a table probably twice as long as this one filled with different bottles and years and all kinds of cool stuff but it was a hundred of us getting together just to share this with each other enjoy each other's company before Christmas sure and then when COVID hit it kind of took those in-person events out of the way right but kind of like we do with real estate we ended up having zoom meetings and zoom drinkings on like Friday nights and Saturday nights like just with all of our friends and you'd look at your computer I patched it into my uh, my big TV and you'd have it cut in like a zoom there's like 60 people on there and you can't all talk at once of course but right. it's cool to be able to still have those kinds of gatherings and see how everyone's holding up and you know what's what's new and it's you know it's the warmest cold call you'll ever make almost ah that's I love it that's fantastic by the way yeah, it's cheers. It's, cheers, brother. So yeah, we've done we've done the bourbon exchange before where everybody has to bring a bottle, mm -hmm. no less than a sixty, seventy dollar bottle. And you get some being from Ohio, we don't have the selection you do down here. But we had people bringing stuff. We get a lottery. Yeah. yeah. So we get a fair chance at we it. We don't even get a lottery. We get what do the stores want us to do? I I hear you. But we I mean that's <laughs> You probably can't get that here very easily either. Well, they didn't even do that this year. Right. And next year, Stag Junior is no longer Stag Junior. It's just called Stag. So, but Buffalo Trace, you can get down here. Once in a blue moon. No kidding? No kidding. Like, I, the store I regularly go to, uh, I know the owner, or the manager very well. Awesome guy. I don't ask for anything of him ever. But I, every time I go in to buy beer or something, we always chat. And I can't tell you how many people walk in. Hey, do you have any Buffalo Trace? And hey, do you have any Buffalo Trace? And he's like, hey, man, I'm sorry. We only got this many, and it's already gone. It's gone when and that's, first hour. Yeah, and that's just how distribution is. You, sure. In Ohio, I can't tell you how many times I see where people are camping out in front of Kroger on Thursday at 6 a.m. because they know when the doors open at 9, it's going to have a, a Weller or something or other. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, we, I mean, we used to get Weller Reserve, just the green label. Mm -hmm. Very regularly, twenty two bucks. We even got the antique regularly, and it was twenty nine dollars. Right now, it's forty nine. Oh man! <laughs> See, I, I can't tell you the last time I saw a red label Weller antique on a shelf in Kentucky. And I I don't go hunting or anything like yeah. that anymore, just because our business is too busy. I don't have time to camp out in a store when I could be doing something for a client. And the market has gotten so crazy from a secondary standpoint that. If you want it, you just go get it yeah. kind of thing. I no, was absolutely. talking to a friend of mine on the way here even. He's just like, you know, I guess the days of hunting for it is gone. I was like, yeah, the days where you'd camp out in front of the store for three hours so that you could get yourself a Van Winkle 12 or something, They're that's gone. gone. Yeah. Like, I mean, and with allocations being what they are and distributors knowing what the secondary game can be, they've kind of changed it all on us. And, you know, it's only a matter of time before it goes the other direction. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we're just all going to have to get into Kila next and we'll be fine. Tequila, Anejo, like, yeah. Have you had the Anejo that's finished in bourbon barrels from Buffalo Trace? I have not. It is fantastic. Yeah? Yes. The, All right. There was a little bar down in Covington, if you're familiar with Agave and Rye. Mm -hmm. There was a little joint next door that was a, uh, a to margarita tequila joint. I think oh, it was a poppy chew, something or other. 
and they had a lot of the Anejo, and they had one of the ones that was finished in a, I want to say it was a George T. Stag barrel, and it was not, it was probably the same color as this Buffalo Trace, but it was tequila, and you opened it up, and it smelled like bourbon. It didn't smell nope. like tequila, but then you drank it, and you were like, this is chewy tequila. This is fantastic. <laughs> so... You could only have like two of them though before you were absolutely just over the top. Well, that's what my concern. I'm looking at this this gamut of mm-hmm. very fantastic choices we have here, um, and we'll get into real estate here in a second. But I'm probably going to take you up on two of these. Sure, two or three. I always say if I bring them and they're open, they're all fair game. Because I want to have you back for another one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can. I have got different things in this as well. No, no, no. These are fantastic. Um, all right, so let's talk real estate a little bit. Yeah. Give me, we're meeting for the first time today. Yeah, pretty I, much. I've got, to, I've got a little background from Kent and Rod on, you know, hey. He's got like the secret history, sort of. No. <laughs> so you started started as a team member. Yes, I, I started in the business in 2002. I okay. was a bike shop manager at a toy store, and a girl I had dated, her stepmom, was a well-known agent at a small company, and the company needed a marketing person. And I having a uh, marketing background from NKU, she said, do you want to interview for this job? I interviewed for it, took the job, and it was like, oh my gosh. I mean, weirdly enough, a lot of people don't know, I didn't even finish college. I actually just went straight into working marketing and real estate. You know what I mean? That's just- Same here. It's what it, well, uh, to a lot of people, they kind of look down on it. And it's like, you can still be successful without a piece of paper on your wall. Absolutely. And uh, so I did that for, let's see, I started in 02. I did marketing for that company. Um, you probably remember Cindy B Realtors from way back in the day. Mm-hmm. That was the company. So yep. if you saw something that was out in the world, whether it was pictures, graphics, anything, that and was you produced me. it. It was cool because learning from Cindy, Cindy was a marketing guru. Like she knew her stuff. Sure. And that's one of the things I really love and respect about her is that she taught me how to not sell a property, but to market a property. Yep. And I think that's very important, especially in a, a market that we are still in, is that you can throw a house on the market and get 100 showings. If you market it right, you're gonna get 25 and you're gonna get more offers. Right. Do you know what I mean? Versus yeah. just every Yahoo walking through the house. Yep. So after five years of watching the business from the sidelines, I went to Cindy and said, do you care if I get my license? And she was like, yeah, I think you've got a great personality. You're very honest and direct and you're getting worse at that and better at it at the same time because I'm not always the best uh, when I put things to my clients and it comes off a little harsh, but that's fine. It's um, I always tell people, be better at giving bad news than you are at giving good news. Yeah. Because they will appreciate you more for bad news than good. I see way too many agents dance around the bad news and make their clients either have false hope mm-hmm. for, hey, we still might get this closed or just blatantly lie to them. Correct. So, yeah, I think it's important to have... I. And it's the same thing I tell people when I go in, used to go into a listing presentation. And if they had unrealistic expectations, you just have the conversation. Yeah. I'd rather turn you down than let you down. And, and that's a fantastic way to put it because I think that that's more of what this business needs. And you and I have both seen it over the course of our careers where the more agents that come into this field, the more yes people that we see. And then you find yourself having to do both sides of the business because the other side is either inexperienced or not strong enough to help their client along. Right. And you don't want them to fail because you don't want the deal to fail. But at right. the same time, you're pushing things along a little bit. Yeah. So started off in 07 as a buyer's agent in 07. Yeah. And did it part-time because I was still wanting to make sure the marketing was taken care of. And then I jumped in with both feet in 2009, like midway through 2009. Great time to start. Oh, let's be a buyer agent in the middle of the worst <laughs> real estate market in the history of the country, right? Other than the depression. So I opened my office in 07. So, so yeah, I, we're right there. Yeah. But, but this is, I think, honestly, that's one of the things that makes us, for our age, be a little bit more of an asset to every generation of buyer, whether sure. you're a millennial brand new buyer or you're someone who is 70 selling your last home because you're going into a home. We've literally seen it all right. and we still have the tenacity, the energy and the just sheer just let's go to yep. get things done. Absolutely. And so I did that and then in 2012 I was presented with the opportunity to come over here to Remax. Um, interviewed with a wonderful agent who's not here anymore. Sure. And um, I got to love Remax. I got to love the dynamics and the people and Kent and Rod and Jim. They're just fantastic people. Do you know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. Everybody's great. 
And, you know, it was finally after a few years, I got to a point where I was like, you know what, I think it's time that I try this on my own. And with the team that I was on, I kind of felt like if I stay here, I'm not going to be able to be known as myself. I'm always going to be known as still being a part of the them. Team. And and I explained that when I left. Sure. And I went off on my own. And the last two in a yeah two years now at this point, uh, I've been over at Coldwell Banker have been absolutely amazing dealing with not just buyers but dealing with sellers and sure. dealing with sellers in this market. Everybody thinks it's like a cakewalk and it's so easy. You just have to put a sign in the yard, and they don't understand that the the inspections and the appraisals and the underwriting woes that we dealt with in 2012 and 2013 and 14 as we are coming out, yep. they're still here. Oh yeah. It's just that the buyers are a little better qualified, but the underwriters are asking for even more information. Right. Well, and I think too, when you talk about putting a sign in the yard and just being done, mm -hmm. a lot of agents, that is their MO. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in order to prove your value, what are you doing to market and get the 25 qualified people instead of the 100? Correct. Um, so it, it goes a long way with showing that you are a professional and here's what I do differently. Mm -hmm. So because, as you know, we've been through markets where it's not as easy as, you know, getting multiple offers on a property. Yeah, an average time on market being 35 and 40 days on market back then – we were welcoming that. We were like, well, oh crap, gosh. if we have to put this thing in the real estate book after this month, this seller is going to want our head. Yep. Versus now, we don't even have that anymore because of the joys of you know the internet and whatnot. I remember when I first got in the business in 02, we had just gotten the Rapitoni MLS system here in Northern Kentucky. Yep. We were just going from the book system to that and having to update all those listings. And I was like, this is going to like revolutionize. And then here we are today using the same system, especially in Cincinnati. Right. They were still in Rapitoni over there. Yep. So it's just like, wow, the, it's changed, but the tools are still there 20 years later. Yeah. So I think that's just the, the growth as well. All right. So we did Buffalo single barrel. Yes. That was a Buffalo Trace single barrel, 90 proof, uh, picked by a local group. It was a shade under, uh, it's like eight and a half years old. So, which is a little bit longer than a lot of the Buffalo Trace single barrels. We picked one with a store earlier this year that I think came in just around nine. So they don't do a lot of those that are that old. Well, and I didn't realize, I told you I was watching a documentary on bourbon last mm -hmm. night, and the history of it was fantastic. Talking about how, you know, they originally were shipping it on flat boats down the Mississippi River, and it became bourbon because of Bourbon County, and that the Louisiana being a French area, mm -hmm. um, that they wanted stuff in charred barrels like brandy. Yes. Um, and then the whole history of, you know, there was obviously a lot of hostility with Native American, Americans at that time. Mm -hmm. And this this was one of the historic facts that they said may or may not be true. But they said they take the flatboats down, couldn't come back on the flatboats because they can't row up the Mississippi. So they'd get the fastest horses mm -hmm. and bring them back to Kentucky. Yeah. I was like, that's incredible. Um but no, what I didn't realize is that every year a barrel is aged, they're paying tax on it. That's correct. So they said it's pretty expensive the more the longer we keep them. It's kind of like the system that they're proposing where you have to get taxed on your assets even before you cash out on them. Yep. It's a similar theory, but the country did that on alcohol because it was something that this year we know what it's worth. We know what it is. Right. Next year it could be something different. And Luckily for them, the market for bourbon especially, I mean, Buffalo Trace is producing more barrels than you can ever imagine. Yeah. And when we went down there recently, they had just finished completing their installation of some of their new big vats. Well, those vats are almost three stories tall yeah. with the amount of barrels that they're planning on producing going forward. And it's great, but it's not, you know what I mean? Because now it's like, well, in 10 years, is it going to be an oversaturated market? Yeah. Or is it going to be undersaturated? Good for us either way. Well, so I'm, <laughs> like I said, I'm not going to hate having more than I can have. Right. You know what I mean? And that's why collections grow to where they are. But no, they they were saying like, hey, most of the distillers were, we're planning for 2036 right now. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's incredible. Like, yeah, just, 15 years from now. Yeah. I, I mean, most of the, the master distillers, is there a better name for that? That's No, that's great. Master distiller. Mm -hmm. Uh, they said they won't get to actually see their product because mm -hmm. by the time they cy cycle out and there's a new one there, now you're releasing that product. Yeah, the one they like uh, yesterday, they just released a 20 year Four Roses out at their brand new visitor center in 
down in Kentucky, and Brent Elliott is their master distiller. He has got just one of the best, like, he's a great judge yeah. when it comes to his picks. I've had a few of them. And they put out a 1,000 bottles of this. But that's probably going to be the last big, big release that he's had his hands on from beginning to finish, more than likely. It's awesome. I mean, it's just, it's, it's rare. And of course, with a lot of these other, you know, Lux Row and some of these other. Um, so that's what we have in front of us now. Yes. And I've never had this. You said it's fantastic. You've had it before. Mm -hmm. um, I have Tom, my CFO. He comes down. He has a place at Cumberland. Okay. So a little liquor store, liquor store there. And he's made good friends with him and says, you know, hey, what do you have special? Mm -hmm. He always brings me back something good. So. Excited to try this. Yeah, you won't be let down by it. Uh, for what it is, and a lot of people, you know, it comes from Bardstown. Yep. Um, I believe it was sourced. I can't recall from where. But it's a 12-year product. It's got a great color. It's got a great nose. And it's a little hotter from a proof standpoint, but yep. it doesn't drink like it's proof. And that's that's important to me because... Well, it scares me a little bit because I usually am on the rocks. Like, I'm a rocks guy. Okay. So drinking them neat, I'm... I would say if you're a, if you are a rocks guy, if your first sip is not where you want it to be, it's way too hot or something of that caliber. Throw a couple four drops of water in, just yeah, a splash real up. quick, and boom, it'll change its entire profile for you. That is a unique taste. Mm -hmm. Like not at all like Buffalo Trace. A little on the hotter side, um, but very good. One of the things I like about Lux Row and some of my other bourbons of choice. Is that the the mid palate and the the back end finish? Mm -hmm. It coats your mouth. Yes, you don't feel like you're overwhelmed by it. I'm not sitting here like coughing and hacking because it's right. so bloody hot. Like you think about when we were younger drinking Wild Turkey 151, thinking oh we were gosh. hot crap. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But we're just like we're idiots. Now yeah. we drink something like this, and it's like, wow, this is a little bit nicer. This is a little bit more refined. I I can do this, but I'm not going to drink. A drink of all of these in one evening right. because we have we have obligations and things to do. <laughs> well, that's why I'm sticking with you know three little samples because I do have a, to drive back to Ohio. Exactly. Um, but I have a meeting after this actually. But um, <laughs> so, tell me what was the transition? First of all, I want to go back to this for a second. Mm -hmm. That cork, mm -hmm. the weight on that. Don't drop it. Is the best cork I've ever felt. So it is. A, it sounds stupid, but it is a solid. Almost brass piece, yes. and it honestly, I've dropped one on my foot. Like you know, it was like my third drink, and I'm just like, I'm just gonna have this and call it a night. And I later dropped it on my foot, and I was just like, oh my god! Because once again, you take it off, you take any of these caps off, it's just what it is. The um, except for the Whistle Pig 18, the crystal. Yes, like this one looks like it's the same. No, this is plastic. Yeah. No, I hate how the Pig 18 fits though. That crystal is so loose in there. So. Well, a lot of decanters are that way, and I can't stand that because you're, losing. you're, you're oxidizing mm -hmm. this. And, I mean, some of these older vintage bourbons, you don't want them to get to that point. Right. You almost have to get the wine corks out and make Stop sure you pull up. everything out. But, yeah, the, the Lux Row is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, that's – it's a different flavor from a lot of things I've had, and I've had a lot. Not as many as you. But, but looking at your, your collection you showed me, like you've got a lot of good things on there. And that's one of the things I've learned about just getting into this. Because I jumped into it with like both feet, like holy crap, here we go. And I've learned that I like a lot of things. But I love just a few. Right. So I have a lot of things I like because now if I decide I want to have something on Tuesday, I can have something different on Friday. Yep. And you're not repeating the same thing versus I think about like my grandfather always drank Maker's Mark and he always made it in Manhattan's and he always made old fashions and that's what he did. But he always had Maker's Mark, Jack Daniels and a few other things. And I'm like, oh my God, if he could have had like this allotment of different stuff, what would he have done? Yeah. Because this is a Buffalo Trace product too. We can't get that in Ohio. Not very easily. No way. It's, I figured you're We used to all the would. time. No, it, we used to get it all the time on the shelf. And now it's really hard to find. That is crazy. It's, that's an easy go-to for 30 bucks. Um, and that's a foolproof. And you get Heaven Hill Six Year, which we don't mm -hmm. get. That's a nice, hey. It's, Green label? Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an easy. It showed up here about a month ago, if I remember right. Because once again, like I don't go hunting, but if I walk right. in the store and it's something out there, yeah. I'll make a phone call and say, hey, did you want one of these? Did you need for one of these? For 10 bucks? Yes. That's like, an easy choice. Every day. So... So tell me more about the transition from what was the, I guess, the biggest hurdle from going from a team member to a individual agent? Um, 
so doing this for as long as I have, you, you do get a little cocky at the time of transition. You think that you're invincible. You can do all of this. And the part that you don't realize until you, you have though. Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> I'm not going to say that. I mean, we still all fake it till we make it to an extent. No, but you're, you're a su successful agent doing very well on your own after making that transition. So, and the transition is still difficult to this day. I mean, like I said, I've been on my own for about two years and a lot of it is just dealing with the support that you may have had before that you don't have now because it was something you took for granted. Uh, when sure. I was with my old team, I had a transaction manager yep. who literally, once I got a pending, they took care of it. I handled the inspection. They took care of it and told me when to go to closing. Yeah. And it was great. And I love that. But now that I'm doing it, I realized I didn't need it almost because okay. I like having that correspondence with my clients. Now, that's also granted where my business is. You know what I mean? If you're doing 25, 30 deals a year, you need that time talking with your clients, being in front of them, being available to them because... That's how you fill your time and convince yourself that you're successful. But when you get to the point where you're like doing 50, 60, sure. you have to have somebody who's going to back your play and help you so that you can go help the next client because you're holding yourself back from helping more people right. by not having that help. Sure. And that's the part I think that has been my biggest hurdle is figuring out who, how to get the right people in that position and go from there. Okay. From an administrative standpoint. Is there a number of transactions that... Like, hey, once I hit hit this, I need the admin, the transaction to close. Uh, personally, I, I've i got a coach. We've all had coaches, things sure. like that. Um, I mean, my coach has always said a certain number from my personal experience locally with the market being what it is. You know, I personally believe that if you're doing more than 40 to 45 deals a year, you need somebody to help you, whether it's administratively or a transaction manager wise, yeah. because that's if they do one or they do the other or they do both, they're taking a lot of things off your plate. Now you have more time to make more phone calls, set more appointments, go on more listing appointments, sell more houses. And that's what your job is. Yeah. I mean, I, I hate having to call and talk with a client who's wanting me to to come to them. And I say, I'm sorry, I'm not taking on new clients right now because I'm not going to degrade the service I have for the people I already have working with me just to add you on board. Right. And that's, that's tough, man. I mean, everybody's like, Oh, you never turn people away. It's like in this business, you sometimes have to, and it's not, you're because one of the few. And I admire that because it's, that's a good trait to have. I, I, I hate doing it. I don't like telling people no when it not. comes to that, but if I was going to give you crappy service and take care of you, or but, not give you service and give you a good agent to call because I know there are great agents who have the, the plate space, yep. then I would rather do that and explain to you why I'm doing what I'm doing. You now, I mean, if I had a client who I wanted to fire because we've always fired clients if we have to, um, buyers or sellers, I mean, then it becomes a whole other deal. Yeah. But I would rather give great service to everyone than give mediocre service to everyone because of how big I had to get. Take note. <laughs> I love that. It's, well, I mean. No, I love that. No, but I mean, I think that that's really what it is, is when you make the transition, you can second guess yourself as much as you want, except when you're on the playing field. And you think about anybody who plays sports. I've, I've, we've worked with sports clients before. Sure. You know what I mean, they all are humans. They all have times where they second guess, should I have swung at that pitch? Should I have made that throw? Should I have done that? But when they're doing it, and they come off the field and that reporter asks them, why did you do that? You very rarely will hear them say, I just screwed up. They're going to say, I looked at the moment, I did what my instincts told me, and that's what I need to do. Well, and I think in this business, we have to do the same thing because there's so many times where if we just let the circle of the process move itself along, you literally will end up somewhere six months from now with nothing because right. you just thought that that's what the dynamic was. Well, it's the same thing that I ran into with running a team. Mm -hmm. I was running a brokerage and a team. And I said, my clients, one of these two is going to suffer. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I said, I'm all in on the brokerage. Um, because, yeah, you just like anybody else, you have internal conflicts. So what should I do? Well, mm -hmm. What do I want to be when I grow up? <laughs> we still ask that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and finally got to the point where I was like, Shannon, who was my, she started out as an assistant, then a buyer's agent, then a partner. I was like, you're better at this than I am. Like, you, here's all my clients, like every one of them. It's go. Oh. And we still run a team to, to this day together. Right. And she is awesome. Like, I, it's it, certainly surrounding yourself with the right people. 
and I that was one of the things that I didn't learn. I learned it in the beginning and didn't realize it yeah. until I got further along in my career that the people you surround yourself with in this business are going to help make you into what you're going to be. Because when I was working for Cindy, Cindy had some of the best agents surrounding her. Some of them are still in this business to this day. One of them we lost this year. Um, you know, they were just fantastic people with great hearts and just worked their tails off. And then, you know, going through the team that I was on before, like there were, you know, having my team leader, Diana, like she was just a genuine good heart who showed me a different side of the business that I didn't know because I came from the Sherman tank, this is how we're going to do it kind of business right. to the, hey, we can kill you with kindness kind of business. And that, <laughs> sure. that when you have a direct, uh, uh, you know, kind of approach, that doesn't always work real well. Right. But it, it learned a lot. And I can see where a lot of newer agents sometimes just get involved in the, the social office, you know, just the normal. Water cooler. Yes, water cooler, we'll call it. And I think that that is what holds a lot of them back from doing 20 and 25 deals in their first year to just doing 10 because they come into the office because it's social hour versus coming in, spend three hours making phone calls and doing what you're supposed to do. Prospecting. And then go play water cooler. Because if you put th two to three hours in of actual prospecting time in your business per day, you can make a lot of money. And people don't realize that. They think that this is just a, like we said, to put your sign in the yard, call it a day. Right. It's funny. I was talking to an agent earlier today. We had a training up in, in Dayton. And she said, you know, she was concerned that her husband might lose his job. Mm -hmm. She's like, so I put the pedal to the metal this year. And mm -hmm. I was like, don't stop. Yeah. Keep your foot on the gas. That's the hardest part, though, for a lot of agents is they turn the gas up and they're going and going and going. And they're like, well, when is my tank going to run out? you're working in your business instead of on your business. And it's it's tough. And I think that's <coughs> I mean, that's a great transition. What, what did you find was your niche? Because a lot of agents don't like prospecting. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what has been successful for you? For me personally, it's been a lot of, I'm not a big social media guy yeah. and everybody is in this business. And that's one of the things I've prided myself on is that I, I get on social media and I interact and I do things because I believe we all need to. But my side is just finding something in common with my clients and trying to hold on to that so that when I talk to you in six months or a year or something like that, I'm not, it's not a cold call. It's a warm call. Yeah. It's like, hey, man, I know you were talking about buying that truck when we, right after you bought the house. Did you end up buying the truck? And they're just like, you won't believe it. I've got a brand new Duramax sitting out in the driveway. And I'm like, dude, that's fantastic. You work your tail off. You deserve to be here. You know, congratulations. Sure. Uh, one of my clients just, um, just had a baby yesterday. And so what did I do? I put the birthday in my calendar for a week prior to a year from now so that I can send a birthday card to their kid for their first, first birthday. birthday. And it's, it, but it's that kind of stuff. Like I think that's been more of my niche. Is not trying to. There's enough business out there for everyone. Oh my god! I don't need all of it. Right. I just want some of it, and I want some of it that's going to be those raving fans. I want those people who, when they get done working with me, and I, I get them to where they want to go, they can c talk to someone on Facebook and say, "Carl's the guy you need to call." Carl's Wait. the guy you need to call. You won't believe this. Carl showed up at my house with his pickup truck because he heard that we needed a couch moved and he was just free that night and showed up. That kind of stuff. I've got to send you. <coughs> I've got it recorded somewhere. We did. We had Brittany Hodak who is – she's now working with experience.com. But she was on Shark Tank mm -hmm. and her whole thing was creating super fans. Mm -hmm. And they were partnering with NFL teams and NBA teams to create the super fans because they are the ones that are going to be your evangelist to spread your name. That's a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. And – just her mentality behind it and how she dissected, like, here's how you identify these people and here's how you market to them and cater to them is brilliant. So No, I would love to I would love to get yeah. my hands on that because I, I believe that that's just – jump right in. I was I gonna say, can, we, can we reach I for know. the big boy now? Oh, yeah, you can. All sure. right. So I've never had this. I'm very excited to try. This is the George T. Stag Uncut Unfiltered 124.9. Mm -hmm. That's a – 2018. Of, so when you talk about we have things that we like and we have things that we love, those are my loves. Those are unicorns. So they are one of the hardest to come by, and I, I've been successful in my career, so I've had a little bit more opportunity to get some of these and some others, of course. But the flavor profile of this is pretty much everything that I can imagine if I was going to create something from scratch and I wanted a just absolute – this is something that everyone – the love, this would be it. Interesting. All right. And I've had every year of it, 
except for the first release in 2002. Wow. Because the cost of that bottle is... I told you he knows more about bourbon than I do. <laughs> and I run a show called Bourbon and Real Estate, so... But, I mean, like, it's just... I don't know. It was one of those things that someone get, got me one early on when I first started getting into bourbon a few years ago before my daughter was born. And it was just something about the profile that spoke to me. And the, then over the course of... You know, there are raffles and different things all over the place. You can find them in Facebook and whatnot. And I was able to get different years. So, like, I've got, like, a 2003. So, like, the second year that they did it. And I'll tell you right now, that is, like, my, of all the hundreds of different bourbons I've had, That's it's it. probably my unicorn, like, must-have. I'll never get my hands on it again because it's, like, stupid, like, $6,000 bottle stupid stuff. Sure. But it's just one of those things. When you find what you like and you love, that's your special occasion bottles. Yes. Do you know what I mean? That's what I drink on my kids' birthdays. That's what I drink when we have family come in from out of town. You know what I mean? That's It's not a, a showboat. It's a, I'm never going to get to enjoy this again. I would rather enjoy it with you yeah. than I would to drink it by myself. Yeah. No, I, cheers. Cheers. Thank you for bringing it. No. I told uh, you I was going to bring you something good. Just, I sat there at home earlier today and I was just like, Man, I don't know what, what he gravitates towards and what his preferences are. And then I was looking at the picture of what you oh, sent me wow. from the cart, and I was like, okay, I think I can run the gamut on this. <laughs> that's, a, that's incredible. So what do you like about it? It's, I like that it's full body. That is a great way to put it. <laughs> um, and, and it's hard to describe, like, how do you explain a complex taste? Because it changes as, as you... As you consume it, um, I had Blanton's Gold yesterday. What did you think of that? I didn't care for it. I don't either. I had the first sip. I was like, "This isn't bad." Mm -hmm. I don't actually care for normal Blanton's. <laughs> so you have a good palate. No, I'm just <laughs> I just say, don't everybody who likes Blanton's. I'm sorry, but you're overpaying for bourbon. You're overpaying for bourbon. It's a hundred. You're paying a hundred dollars a bottle for something that honestly I probably wouldn't pay forty dollars for. Anyways, I think it's a good twenty minute dollar bottle. Sure, <laughs> double yeah. bottle. Um, if you have a birth date that you're searching for so that you can have one for your kid, no, do it. No. But I've, I, I've got one for myself, so I'm not a bougie guy to extent. But So it's weird drinking this back-to-back -back at the Lux Row. Because they're both higher proofs. They're both higher proofs, completely different tastes. This is good and different. It's kind of like that, did you figure out which year I had on the handy? Uh, no, I didn't, because I was looking at your laser code and what you were talking about. I was trying to figure I out did. what it was. So you see how this one's written? Yeah, that's easy to find. L18. No, so mine, that one's a little bit higher, and it's not and It's white. Yours is, like, faded a little bit. Yeah. So it tells me yours is possibly going to be, like, a 14 or a 15 or something that's really older. Okay. So love that baby, because that baby's amazing. <laughs> and that's that's a foolproof. That is a foolproof ride as well. Well, and it's funny, because Mark, one of my colleagues that started Bourbon Real Estate with me, Mark Ryan? Mark Burr. Okay. Mark Ryan, yeah. He was on yesterday's show. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we talked about uh, building wealth through short-term rentals. Okay. So, had a great show yesterday. That is a great show. Um, but, yeah, we... So, Mark Burger and I, we started the show, and he gave me the blind taste test one day. But he threw that in at the end after I had low proof. That's dirty. And I said, this is my least favorite. Even though I know, like, drinking it straight from the bottle... That is one of my favorites. Sure. Like, that is in my top three. Mm -hmm. So, it, he, he did me dirty on that one. I think he did. <laughs> I, I am a big believer in, if you're going to do a taste, blind tasting, everything has to be even keeled. You can't have three bunters and one slugger. It doesn't make sense. Right. If you're going to do a bottle that's a $400 bottle, then they all need to be $400 bottles because then it's an even playing field. Yeah. But, I, I mean, typically what I did was I had a buddy of mine, uh, he makes custom cork coasters and he made them with one two three four so what we would do is i'd get my four bottles picked out and then i would line up the tasting if you will and set all the glasses on one two three four as well and then i would mix the bottles up in order so that that way if you were looking at what we were drinking it was blind right. but you didn't know which was which unless you actually had a palate that you've had some of this stuff sure so because i can mean, i could put these four next to each other and you think one two three four but it's actually two, four, you know what I'm saying? It's out of order. And right. then you get done and you're like, oh, wait a second. Or I throw the blanket over and then you never know. I did one of these taste tests for my niece's boyfriend. He's 22. Mm -hmm. And he's just getting into bourbon. So I was like, I'll give you the kind of a starter. And at first I was like, I'll give him the pig 18. I'm like, he doesn't have the palate for that. Let's let's step it down. Let's not do that. Let's go Weller. Mm -hmm. 
um, Buffalo Trace. Yep. You know, some of the easier sipping bourbons. Eaton Sand. You know what he liked, though? Old Granddad. I'm telling you, the Old Granddad, for what it is, is not a bad drinker. It It's one of my go-tos. Mm-hmm. Like, that is a weeknight pay. Because 30 bucks is... 30 bucks. 30 bucks. And it's going to... And, it, and it, that's the good thing too is that a lot of people when they hear that you're into bourbon or you're here you're into you know any kind of booze they were like oh my god these guys are just lushes they just that's all they do and it's like no this is more kind of just something that's I count it as a reward do you know what I mean like I love the history and I can tell you that after doing barrel picks and things like that with different groups going down to Buffalo Trace they are getting back into their tours and if you're able to go down there and do the hard hat tour. They take you, or do the Taylor tour. They'll take you through the oldest building on the property that sits right along the river where they excavated and actually found an old copper distiller. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then they took and they actually sent the copper sample to a grader, had it graded, (laughs) and rebuilt the still out of the exact same grade copper that was used when Taylor did his. That's insane. And, and honestly, I, that's one of the things, I've, as many times as I've been there, I think I've been there half a dozen times, I always learn something new every time I go down there. And that's just, once again, one of the things that brings me where I tie it to real estate. Yeah. Because literally, we can have a hundred different bottles. Each one's going to have a different story. Each one's going to have a different source, a different way of being made. It had the same result, and some were better than others. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, that's... I loved in the show last night that I was watching. So there's no bomb, bad bottle. There's just different. Yeah, there's a couple of bad bottles. I, I agree. I got the shotgun shell one when I was down at. Oh my gosh, are you serious? Yeah. The one with the snake guy around it? Yeah. Okay. It's terrible. I have never in my entire life drain poured a bottle <laughs> because I felt like if I'm going to pay the money for this, I'm going to drink this thing. I'm going to suck it up. I'm going to say this is what I'm doing. And I wanted it because I was going to use it as a decanter because I was doing It's a, a cool bottle. I was going to do an Eagle Rare blend. Yeah. So every time I had this much left in an Eagle Rare, I would just dump it in there. Infinity bottle kind of Correct. thing. Correct. Yeah. So I did it in a different decanter because that bottle wasn't finished yet. I couldn't bring myself to drink it because it was so bad. And I'm not going to use the name. I'm not going to disparage that company because they did what they did. Yep. But you obviously probably know what it is from talking, you know, our description of the sure. bottle. I, I unlabeled all of mine, so there's no badging on it even. It's a naked car at this point. And I actually ended up drain pouring the last third of it because I just couldn't bring myself to drink it. Jeez. And now it sits on my shelf with a blend in it right now. And I every time I look at it, I don't even know if I want to drink the blend because I have bad flashbacks. But that's probably the only bad bottle I've ever had. Yeah, I bought that last time I was down here. And I was like... Mm-hmm. We special, me and three friends special ordered it from somewhere out west because we couldn't get it locally and they were willing to ship us three bottles. So I said, let's get three. We'll all drink it together. It'll be a great time. And we cracked it the first night and it was probably our third drink in. And literally all of us were just like, well, it just needs to breathe a little bit. We'll have a couple other drinks. And then we never went back to it. No. And I, it is what it is. You'll, you'll have those bad days. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love it. Like, it's not even the best one, in my opinion, but in but the it, last five years, it's probably my number... In, my, in the last five years, I would say that it's my number three. Right. 2020 was fantastic. 2018 was fantastic. The only other one that's in my top five that I know I'll probably never have again is one of the Orphan Barrels. Okay. The Rhetorics? Yeah. Those aren't bad at all. It was fantastic. I mean, it also has to do with the atmosphere, when you're having it, who you're with, the memory of that night... But like I said, that's bourbon community. Yeah. Because I can tell you, I can go to five different people's houses and have five different selections to go off of because they're going to share what they want to share with you and they're going to share what they want with you. Yeah. But I know that out of those people, I'm never going to have a bad pour, if you will. Yeah. And if we're having a great night or we're you know celebrating or if we're having a loss or something's going on, you know what I mean? It is. It's the atmosphere of when you have it as Absolutely. well. Man, we can talk for hours. Hours. Carl, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. We'll definitely do this again. No, I would love to. We'll get more into the, the real estate side of things than <laughs> the urban <laughs> side of things. Unless you want me to bore you with that crap, too. No, we'll just uh, stage this as a part one, part two. Hey, I'm all for that. Cool. I'm all for that. Cool.